Amen. So, continuing on through the book of Matthew, and we're getting into uh, chapter 6 tonight. And I'm not planning on getting through the whole thing, but uh, we'll see how far we can get. But we'll start right, dive right in there where it says in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Now, the first thing I want to point out there is to take heed that you do not your alms before men. So alms isn't a word that we use a lot, obviously, in today's vernacular, but it, it's a biblical word. And what? let me just start out by saying what alms is not, because I've, I've known people in the past that have gotten confused about this. And whether or not anybody in here is confused, I, I, I kind of doubt it. But just in case, you know, the alms does not mean tithes. That's two different things there. Yeah. And it's funny, um, you know, up at Phoenix, I, I take up the offering. I've been doing that for several years now. I'll go around with the plate and pick up the offering. And you can kind of tell the people who are confused about this because they get this idea that when they put their tithe in the plate, they have to be secret about it. Like they, you know, or some churches will even put a box in the back so you can, so no one knows what you're doing. But here's the thing: an alms is not a tithe. Tithe is something that we can be we can be public about because of the fact that it's something we're supposed to be doing. You know, God, that's what's expected. Alms is going above and beyond what is expected of the tithe. You know, we're going to get into what exactly an alms is, but let me start out by saying it is not the tithe. And it's funny because be, I'd be passing an offering plate and people would crumple up their, their wad of cash into this tiny, tight, folded little wad of money. And then they'd, they'd clench it in their fist and they'd hold it way down. They'd be sitting in the chair and they would squat down. They'd have that thing about eight inches off the floor. I'm not kidding. You think I'm exaggerating. <laughs> And I'd have to take that plate and like bend it over <laughs> and be like, let them put it in there, you know, like because they're, they're trying to do it in secret. That's like the only thing I can figure. And I, I joked in the past about just when, if I was ever, you know, I got, I would get so fed up and frustrated with this that one day I was just going to stand up in front of everybody in the church while the plate was going on, pull out my wallet and just count my tithe out out loud. Just so I'm like, everybody see that I'm paying my tithe, you know, just because it, it was frustrating that people would think that the alms is, is the tithe, you know, and, and they're trying to be all discreet about it. And I was just trying to make the point, it's not something that you have to be discreet about. We don't, that's why we don't have a box in the back here. You can throw it right in the plate as the plate goes around, and just because that's what's expected. You know, the tithe is the Lord's, as the Bible says. But what an alms is, an alms is what you would give to the poor. If you would turn over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 real quick. And keep something in Matthew all night tonight. But in Acts 3, we're going to see that very clearly from the scripture that alms is simply this it's simply when you're going to give something to the poor when you're going to give something to the needy <clears throat> the bible says in acts chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 now when peter and john went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour and a certain man lay a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple which is called beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So that's what this guy was doing because, you know, and this is one of those few instances where we can see where it would be appropriate for somebody to ask, to, to, to beg, basically, is what they're doing, or ask for alms. Why is that? Because this guy was lame from his mother's womb, and they had to carry him. So this is a guy whose legs or feet were not working. In fact, it goes on the story, it says that it, it, it was his ankles that weren't working. You know, so this is not the guy that's standing, and I know I kind of went off, I think, last Sunday in here about on these guys already, but the guys that you see, and I'm going to go off again because it happened to me again this week coming out of Food City, some 20-something-year-old guy standing there, smoking a cigarette, you know, standing upright, obviously walk there, you know, and, 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 and uh, like sees me coming, sir, do you got any spare change? And again, it's, it's some about this face that just screams sucker. I don't know what it is. Like, I looked at my shirt. It didn't say ATM on it. You know, and, and it's really hard for me to keep my cool with these guys. And if I, I don't know, you know, I just look at them and say, nah. You know, I keep walking. Just try to, because I have gotten a little curt with one of them. Boy, they get offended. they just like, oh, you've got to be like that. You know, it's like, well, you know, I'm a little offended that you're a perfectly capable, you know, able-bodied individual, and you're sitting here begging money. And I love how they say, do you have any spare change? Huh? I wanted to, if I had any change, I would have said, none of it's spare. I would have jangled it right at him. You know, I would say, <laughs> I need every penny I got. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to raise a family. Amen. And something tells me that guy isn't, but uh, who knows, maybe he is. But he wasn't laid there. You know, nobody carried him to Food City and laid him outside the door so he could ask alms. He, he walked himself there. And, and uh, so there I got that off my chest again. I'm, I'm sure by, by the time I come back here on Sunday, some other bum will have asked me for money and I'll have to go off on it again. So. <laughs> but we see here from Acts that 
you know, if you, um, that, that alms is simply giving to the poor. And, you know, we kind of, I kind of get after these guys and things like that. And I never, but I never want us to get a hardened heart towards giving to the poor because that is something we should do. That is something we should, if we see somebody in need, that's somebody who really is kind of down and out and really does need a helping hand, um, to be willing to do that. The Bible says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he giveth uh, shall, uh, I don't know how it goes, shall be repaid to him again. You know, if we, if we lend unto the Lord when we give to the poor, you know, God keeps track of that. God will, God will make sure that that comes back around on us. And it might be in an instance when we're down in our luck. So there might be a hard time that we go through in our life. There might be a season, an unexpected bill or illness or something pops up where we need help. You know, it, it, if that could happen. It could be that that's when God's going to repay us, when we can ask for, for alms for people that we know. Um, so, you know, it's important that we, we, we keep that in mind, and of course that we don't just give to every bum that asks us, but to understand that, you know, there is a time and a place to give to the poor. Now, it says here in verse 2 of Matthew 6, it says, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, verse 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the streets and in the, in the synagogues and the streets that they may have glory of men. For I say unto you that they have their reward. Now when you read that, you think, surely there's nobody that does that. I mean, it says there that sound a trumpet before thee. I mean, literally, can you imagine that? Can you imagine like the guy at Food City asked me if I have any spare chains? And I'm like, just a second. And I pull out my trumpet and I face the parking lot and just... I'm giving my spare chains to this guy. And you know... You would say that's ridiculous, but that's what Jesus said these guys did. That they would sound a trumpet before them. They wanted everyone. And what was the purpose? That they might have glory in men. That everyone might say, oh, that guy is so generous. Look how he just gives to these people. And it, it was, you know, this, this is the uh, celebrity, yeah. you know, the wealthy individual who makes a show of their giving. And it was funny because I, I, I got done writing this sermon. I hopped on Facebook for a second. And I kid you not, the second story on my news feed was Tyler Perry of Aerosmith. Yeah, we all know who that is, right? Was it, no, was, was it Tyler Perry? Or is that the other guy? I don't know. There's a lead singer, Aerosmith. I'm glad I can't remember. It's, it, my brain's getting washed. Steven so we, Tyler. <laughs> Steven Tyler, thank you. Yeah, Tyler Perry. I think that's like the, the comedian or something. But Steven Tyler, yeah, he's the second guy in my news feed, and he's like making this big show. He's got this big story about how he's giving a half a million dollars to... Uh, to uh, Janie's house. So he's got like this big house that he built for troubled uh, uh, girls or whatever, like abused people, abused young ladies. You know, and that's a terrible thing. And, I, and I'm sorry that kind of stuff goes on. And it's great that somebody wants to help out in that way. But I'm telling you what, that guy, uh, Steven Tyler, right? He has his reward. You know, he had his, he had his 10 seconds of fame on my Facebook feed. That's it. That's all he's going to get. There's, not, there's nothing else for him. Because why? Because he gave all that money, maybe even for a good cause, but he, he did it before men. And he did it to be seen of men. Right? So we got to watch out for that. You know, this, this false humility that people have of, of when it comes to giving. You think about like the, the so-and-so foundation. I love it when they give and to some foundation that they establish and then they name it after themselves. Just so everybody knows, like the Rockefeller Foundation, right? Everybody knows for generations to come, well, it was Sir Rockefeller or whatever his name was. Mr. Rockefeller, he is the one that started this foundation. They all do that, like to name the foundation after themselves. <laughs> and even if it's a good thing, you know, you think there's even people who make a, a hobby out of this. They're professionals, they're philanthropists, right? You've heard of that, people who just make a habit or a, a hobby of, of giving a large donations to, to causes that they deem worthy. And often, you know, they want to be known. They want to have their, they want their name on the plaque. They want to be at the, the, the blue ribbon, yellow ribbon, whatever ceremony where they cut it. They want to sink the golden shovel into the first, you know, earth for when, they, when they break ground and all that stuff and get their picture taken with the mayor and the city council and have it in the paper. Well, you know what? That's, maybe it's even for a good cause. Maybe it's going to do some, do some good for the community. But the Bible says you have your reward. You know, you're not storing up anything for you in heaven. If we're going to give alms, if we're going to do something... We should do it in secret. We should do it uh, so secretly, as it says here, when thou doest thine alms. You know, and it says when. You know, that's the thing. I don't. We preach against give, you know people giving in this manner. I don't want it to turn into uh, you know a sermon against giving. You know, there there is a time and a place, as it says there. It says when thou givest thine alms, right? And if you would turn over to Galatians chapter six and say, well, you know, when when is it that we're supposed to give? 
You know, if we're supposed to give alms, he does say when, not if, you know, when you give your alms. Because the thing is, there, there is going to be times that we have where we can give alms. Maybe we've been blessed with a little extra income a certain month, or we're doing well in a business or financially, and we have excess, we have the ability to give. The Bible says here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, as we therefore, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. You know, that's one of the great things about church when you come to church on a regular basis and you get to know people, as you establish a network, you establish friendships, you establish you know, real significant and meaningful relationships. Those are, those are the kind of relationships that we should have in church. Churches that are relationships that actually count for something. Not just shallow kind of relationships like that you might expect to develop at work or some social club or something like that. But these are, because the fact is, if we're saved, you know, we've got all eternity together. We are, we are members of a spiritual family. And we ought to, you know, spend time getting to know one another. And one of the reasons we do that is because of the fact that if we're down, like a spiritual family, we can lift each other up. We can, ha we can give and help one another out when, when opportunity arises within the local church. As it says there, um, as you have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially of them who are the household of faith. So we should, you know, it's hard to know what other people's needs are if you don't get to know that person. I mean, how are we going to know if somebody's struggling if, if we don't show up to church and, and, and get to know people? It's going to be hard to, to know that about people, to have that opportunity to do good, un, do good unto them that are the household of faith, to give those alms, to, to help somebody out that's down, that, that, that needs some help. <clears throat> but he says when you do that, is to not let, you know, not to let thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. <clears throat> And now it says there in verse 4, if you would look at verse 4, the Bible says, uh, it's chapter 6, verse 4, beginning in verse 3, But when thou doest thine alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Why? Verse 4, That thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee. Now, if I'm going to get a reward from somebody, I don't think you there's anybody better you can get a reward for than the Heavenly Father. Amen. You know, our Father, which is in heaven, that, that's the one who's going to reward us. Amen. So if we do it secretly, we're not going to receive, perhaps, our, you know, our reward on this earth. You know, we're not going to be uh, like Steven Tyler. You know, we're not going to be on Facebook and, and, and people seeing us give all this money. We're not going to give a speech in front of a crowd and talk about, you know, how we were just burdened to give all this money and so on and so forth. We're not going to receive glory of men. We're not going to receive our reward here. But I tell you what, the Bible does say here that if you do give alms, if you do do good to them, as opportunity comes, uh, you'll be rewarded of your heavenly Father. You know, it might not be till you die and go to heaven. You know, you might give and, and help others out, and maybe it'll never come back on you in this life. But God keeps track of it all. And when you get to heaven, there will be a reward for you. That, that's a promise. That's what, that is a promise from God. Let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 38. I mean, that is a promise right out of the words of Jesus Christ in His mouth, of Jesus Christ Himself. That if we give in secret and not let left, our left hand know what our right hand doeth, you know, if our motives are right, to the point where we're, we're not even, do, we're just doing it out of the, a, a genuine and sincere heart, that we'll have reward. That is a promise of God. Look at uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 38. <clears throat> Give, and it shall be given unto you, he said. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So these are promises from the Word of God that if we are generous people, that if we're people that are willing to give, maybe not always of our money, maybe it might be of our time, our energy, it might be you know, something something very as simple as that, that we're going to receive again from others, that our Father is going to reward us. Now, of course, as all promises are, they all require faith, right? This is something that we can't just, you know, half-heartedly believe when we do this. You have to believe this by faith. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So that's the promise that, that we would be uh, uh, receive from God again, but that, that promise is something we have to believe by faith. Not only is it something that we have to believe by faith, but this promise that God will reward us for the things that we do, for the, for the good works, for the alms, for the giving, for the generosity that we show towards others, 
But this is a promise that requires integrity. You know, this is something, this is kind of what he's getting at here. This is, they have to have, come from a right motive in your heart that you want to give for the right reasons. That's why it says, let not thy right hand know what thy left hand doeth. And, uh, you know, I've seen people do that in my own life. People that have been good towards me. They, they did something for me. They, you know, bought me something that I needed or helped me out in a situation. And them coming to me and saying, hey, don't tell anybody else about what I did for you. You know, and, I, and there's been instances where, where they came to me and said, just make sure it's between me and you. And they said to me, I don't want my right hand to know what my left hand did. You know, because they're... Because they want to do it for the right reasons, not so that I could go around and tell everybody, oh, he's so great, oh, so-and-so did this for me, and so-and-so did for that, this for me. You know, we should do things for the right reasons. If we're going to be generous towards somebody, if we're going to help somebody out, we should do it because we love that person, because we want to help that person. Not so that we can hopefully, you know, they'll go around and tell everybody else what a great guy we are and how generous we are. And hopefully they don't do that because then everybody might start coming to you, right? Think about that. Everybody might start hitting you up. Well, I heard you were real generous, you know. <laughs> you know, so can you dig a little deeper? And Mr. Deep Pockets over there, right? So the summary of these first four verses really is this: that true generosity is something that comes from the heart. You know, it comes from a a sincere desire that that charity would come out of a pure heart, as it says in, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter one. That the people we would be sincere, that we do things for the right reasons with the right motives. And really, as the chapter kind of goes on here. Uh, in verses six through seven, it kind of it kind of talks about this. It's kind of the same principle throughout that, and just applied in different ways. As it says there in verse five, it says, "And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward." You know, so this is the guy who is called to pray at you know some public assembly or you know what you know they have some big national day of prayer. And they're getting up, and they're going to get up, and this is how they pray. You know, they pull it out, and they they put their 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 prayer down, and they and they they pray with their eyes wide open, and it's almost as if they're reading their prayer, because that's exactly what they're doing. You know, this is a prayer again that's not coming from the heart. It's not heartfelt. It's not sincere. What they're doing is they're getting up. It's, instead of calling it a prayer, they should call it what it is, which is which is a speech. They're getting up and, and basically delivering maybe a moving speech, maybe a touching speech, but it's not prayer. Because they're doing it, as it says there, that they may be seen of men. And they have their reward, you know. They're gonna, they have men say, oh, what a, what a spiritual individual. What a, what a moving, powerful speech that was. What a, what a heartfelt, you know, you touched me, man. That was great, you know. That's your reward if that's, what, if that's, if that's how you're going to pray before men. Now, of course, that's not referring to just public prayer all the time. Obviously, when we pray in church, we call on folks to pray here in church. But, you know, I've never seen anyone wax eloquent, you know, and saying, hey, can you open us up in a word of prayer? You know, you know, oh, our Father who art in heaven, hello, you know, just start, you know, waxing eloquent and carrying on and just going on. And, and I've never seen anybody do that, and I never expect to either. And, and really, when we pray in public, it should be short. It should be quick. I think the shorter, the better. Lord, I mean, I, I've heard a guy pray this, Lord, bless the service. Amen. I said, Amen. <laughs> That's what we want, right? I mean, we want God to bless the service. As long as that guy meant it, you know, he's not up there trying. At least you could say about that guy, you may say, well, that's not a very impressive prayer. Well, it shouldn't be. Yeah. That's not the point. Amen. We're asking him to ask God to bless the service for yeah. us. He's going to pray for all of us, not asking that. Hey, brother, impress us with your prayer. That's not, you know, that's not what we're asking. We're asking him to bless the service. So if you were to pray something as simple as that, bless the service, Amen. You know, that's, that's a good prayer, right? I'll amen that. But we shouldn't pray, uh, you know, to, to be seen of men. And this principle, it's, it's just the same thing. The re receiving a reward for giving your alms, for praying, uh, and, and everything else. You know, it's, you know, prayer is a very personal and private matter. You know, and I don't want to go on about prayer tonight. I mean, really, it's something that probably deserves its own sermon. But prayer is one thing that's supposed to be very personal and private. It's not something that really, I think we should talk a lot about. I mean, either if you're doing it, you know, then, then you're right and, and there's really nothing to talk about. It's just something we should all be doing, right? We should pray daily and ask those things that we have need of. And that's, that's about it. And that's really why I don't advocate and never will in this church, you know, and ask for, hey, can we have a men's prayer night? You know, Pastor Anderson doesn't do that and I'm relieved. Because I was at a church for a long time. And I mean, I can tell you, I've spent hours, I mean hours, I've probably spent one hour a week for about a decade 
So do the math, you know. Uh, in a men's prayer meeting where guys come together at the church building, they stand, they sit there, and it's kind of like where the men talk and they have their little meeting and talk about kind of things, what's going on, and then they have prayer requests, and then they all take turns praying in a circle with everybody listening, you know. And that's to me that that's not going into the closet and shutting the door. You know, I, I'm not going to say you're wrong to do that, but it's just to me, it, it's just not something that we need to have. You know, it might be something nice, but I think prayer is something that's very private and very personal, and that's where God wants us to do it. Is when we have shut the door and locked it behind us. You know, I'm never going to advocate for watch nights. I don't know if anyone's ever been a part of a watch night service. Or, or not necessarily a, a church service, but a prayer service where the men will come and you'll have shifts. Where, so there's always a man praying at the altar all night, throughout the night. You know, every, So you would sleep somewhere in the building, and then when your hour of prayer was come, the other brother who was relieving his shift would come wake you up, and then you would go out into the, in the sanctuary and you would pray at the altar, and, and then when you're sh and you would pray for an hour, and, and see, some, some of you give me looks like, that sounds weird. It is kind of weird. Right? <laughs> right? It's like, I could do that at home. Why did I have to drive all the way here and pray? I mean, there's nothing special about the building. The building's just a building. You know, I can be heard of God as much as I can in my, you know, my own bedroom with the door shut as I can in some building. Maybe even more so, you know, you know I, I would say. So that's why I'll never advocate for that kind of thing, you know, or altar calls. I mean, is that, is that private prayer? You know, come on down to the altar and pray in front of all these people. You know, stick your hinder parts up in the air and everybody else behind you. And hey, I was that guy. You know, I've been at plenty of altar calls, and I was, you know, I was hitting that altar every, every other service. You know, and and a part of it probably, if I had to be honest with myself, is because, you know, I didn't want somebody to think there was something wrong with me. Yeah. Boy, I should I should be at the altar. You know, and if you don't go, if you and if you turn on those guys that goes to the altar on a regular basis, and you start not going, oh boy, you know, the pastor he's gonna, what's going on, brother? Are you gonna, you know, because because a man is going to see you not doing that. Or, he's, he, or he is going to see you going to the altar. But we shouldn't, that's why I'm never going to advocate for those things. Prayer nights, men's prayer meeting, the altar. And the prayer and the altar, we, believe me, we could go on about that. There's several reasons why we, we shouldn't have those in our churches, but we won't go on and on. But you can see the whole point here in these verses is that it's to not be seen of men. Everything that we do for God should be from a sincere heart, from a pure heart, with right motives, and that for the right reasons that we would help others and, and, and that our prayer would be that which is done in private. He goes on and talks here about prayer in verse 7. <laughs> he says, but when you pray, so again, don't get the wrong idea about prayer, that just because he's saying don't do it before men, that doesn't mean don't do it at all. It is still something that's a big part of the Christian life that we should be doing. You know, a lot of times we go without in life and we go with a lot of anxiousness and worry and and, and, and we go not have receiving the blessings from God. And what does the Bible say? You have not because you ask not. You know, and, and when you ask, you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. So <clears throat> we should be praying, as it says here, when ye pray. And he goes on and tells us, use not vain repetitions as the heathen. So when he's saying vain repetitions, of course, a lot of times people will think about vanity, right? The vanity mirror. Now he's not saying like, you know, try to look good while you're praying, you know, repeatedly. What he's saying is don't use rep vain repetitions, meaning repetitions that produce no results. They're empty. That's, that, that's what vain is meaning there. It's, it's something that's empty. It's something that is futile. It's something that is pointless. It's useless. It's worthless. They're not, they're, it's not doing them any good for them to go and pray and use vain repetitions. <clears throat> I mean, you think about, you know, of course, we could talk about uh, it's saying, you know, vain repetition. So, of course, this is probably referring to, like, repetitive, saying the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Or chanting, you know. Of course, we all know who that's probably referring to, right? The Catholic Church. Yeah. You know, you go and you do your penance, and they say, I was never in the Catholic Church. So, it's like, you know, however many Hail Marys you get, and how many Our Fathers, you know, and that's it. So, now you just need to go repeat these prayers, these words, just... Let them roll off your tongue a dozen times each and you're absolved of these sins somehow. So he's specifically speaking against that here. You know, and it's amazing how many things the Catholic Church gets wrong in light of Scripture. And this is just glaring. You know, don't use vain repetitions. Don't sit there and chant and say the same thing over and over and over and over again is what he's saying here. You know, no Hail Marys, no Our Fathers. You know, we could pick on the Buddhists with their own, own, 
Om, he's sitting there saying Om, you know, over and over again. That's heathen, he says there. He says that's something that a heathen would do. <clears throat> Be not therefore like unto them, for your father would knoweth what things ye have need of. <clears throat> So no, don't don't be repetitive in your in your prayer life. Be genuine. Be real. Now it's now he says don't be you know uh, not to use vain repetitions. That doesn't mean you know it is okay to pray for the same thing over and over again. You know don't feel like I already prayed for this once. I don't need to pray for that again. I don't want to you know I don't want to get in vain repetitions. That's not what he's talking about. You know there's things that we should be insistent about about prayer. Maybe there's something that we have to bring up repeatedly before God. Names of people that we have to mention before the throne of God repeatedly. That we're just trying to get God's attention. We're not, we're not just reciting something. But you, it, you can repeat things. You can repeat requests. You can certainly do that. Turn over to Luke chapter 18. I mean, that's a principle that's taught in Scripture that we should uh, use in pre not in precatory prayer, but uh, you know, we should plead for those for those things that are, you know, maybe more of a serious nature, things that we have more of a burden for, things that we really, really want to see God come through with, we have to implore yeah. God. Uh, imp, uh, imp, you know, it's called uh, importune prayer, importunity. So if we're going to look here at, uh, look at Luke chapter 18, look at verse 1. It says, And he spake a parable unto them this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So if you ask whether or not we should pray, well, it says right there, we ought always to pray. And not faint. Saying that there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversaries. And he would not for a while, but after what he, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because the widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, with, lest by her continual coming she weary, she weary me. So why did this judge do something? Because she kept coming to him. She said, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me. She was always coming to this guy. And you know, God is likened unto a judge. You know, God is the judge of the whole earth. The Lord is the judge of the whole earth, the Bible Amen. says. Now, he's the just judge, you know. Right? But <clears throat> we should definitely, the principle that's being taught here is that sometimes we need to go to God about the same thing over and over and over again. You know, we got that lost loved one that we want to get saved, to see saved. You know, maybe we should pray a little harder. I'm not saying that God's going to pull strings and, and make some magic trick. You know, we're not Calvinists here. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we could pray things like, God, help them, you know, the scales fall off their eyes. Open the eyes of their understanding. Give them a heart to understand. Give them ears to hear. Work in their life. Do whatever it takes. I mean, there's things that we could pray for that person that might give, bring them, open them up to the gospel. I mean, that's what we need to pray. Is, Lord, just give me an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Soften their heart. Tender their heart. You know, help them to, to, to receive the word. Help them to have help me to have opportunity to preach to them. I mean, that might be something we have to pray often about. Or we can even think about maybe there's some temptation, there's some sin in our life that we struggle with. You know, that might be something that we have to die daily about. That might be something that we have to go to God about repeatedly, right? And ask the Lord, help me, give me strength, give me ability to overcome this sin, whatever it might be. To uh, to, to, to so so that repeating prayer requests is not the same as you know. Vain repetitions is the point I'm trying to make here. And we should be people that pray. We should be a people of prayer. And <clears throat> we could think about what Paul said, right? When he had the thorn in the flesh, when he was, for the abundance of revelations that was given unto him, you know, the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet him, lest he should be lifted up above measure. And you know, a thorn in the flesh, right? And he, what did he do? He says, And I besought the Lord thrice that it would depart from me. And it didn't, you know, and he said he, that he might know that. Uh, and strength and weakness he has made strong, that his grace is sufficient for thee. So he prayed three, three times, though. He prayed once, the Lord said no. Prayed twice, the Lord said no. Prayed three times, and he said no. You know, and sometimes that's the thing about prayer. You know, I've heard it said, and, and, I, and I believe this, God always answers prayer. Sometimes it's just not the answer we want. You know, we ask for something, sometimes the answer is no, as it was with Paul here. And it's interesting in verse 7 there, uh, the way it words it, it says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. And I was kind of talking about earlier about a guy who just gets up and reads the speech. He's not really praying. Well, it's the same thing here. These people, they're just speaking. They're not praying. They're just speaking. The heathens speak, but it's God's children that pray. Because prayer is simply this. It's just to ask. You know, people kind of have this super mystical... And go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 32 real quick. 
Genesis chapter 2, 32. People kind of get this, this idea, well, what is prayer? But well, prayer is simply just to ask. That's what it means. That we should just be going to God daily and just asking for those things that we have need of. It says in uh, Genesis chapter 32, let's look at verse 29, where we'll see that prayer and ask is something that's, that's uh, you know, used uh, synonymously. It says, And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? So you can see where he says, He asked him. And what did he say? He said, I pray thee. Right? So prayer, and we could go and look where it says, The phrase, I pray you, is just used repeatedly in Scripture. I mean, hundreds of times. Where it's, you know, sometimes it's something a man is saying to another man, another human is saying to another human. You're just saying, hey, I pray you. You know, our, it's not even necessarily something that you do to God. But because prayer is just asking, right? So when we pray, we should pray to God, of course. <clears throat> but we should go to God and we should ask for things. <clears throat> and why is that? If you would turn to Matthew chapter 6 again. Because this is, this is something that... Uh, that I think this maybe maybe if we understood this a little bit more, we'd be people that pray a little bit more. The mm -hmm. Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter six, look at verse eight. <clears throat> it says in Matthew chapter six, verse eight, "Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him." I mean, that's a comforting verse. That's something if we really just sit here and meditate, and think about what the Bible's saying right there. I mean, that's kind of that's pretty one of those profound verses that that really should strike us that. That God already knows the things that we have need of before we even ask Him. And I love there that He, uh, it's just showing us that, you know, it calls Him the Father, you know. You know, uh, after this matter, it says, For your Father knoweth what things you have need of. And that's our Father that we're going to. And if we think about, you know, if, if we are those that have children, think about when, you know, sometimes maybe we're having a little bit of a rough day and our kid, you know, or a child, one of our children will come and ask something from us. And they'll ask it, you know, just a sweet, simple way, just a simple request. You know, and you can just see how much they're just counting on you to come through. You know, like, Dad, can I have a hug? Or, Dad, will you know, you, will you stuck me on the couch? Or, hey, can I have a sandwich? Or, can we go to the, can we go to the park? You know, just these simple, innocent requests. And, and it just reminds us, you know, what's really important. And what is it? that We're delighting in our children at that point. You know, we, we want our kids to come and ask things of us, I think. I mean, at least we should that... It's nice to know that our children are, are counting on us. You know, it gives us a sense of, of purpose. You know, and I'm not saying that God needs us to come to Him to have a sense of purpose. But the point I am trying to make is that God delights in the prayers of His children. I mean, that's if that that's one reason why we ought to be people that pray is the fact that that God wants us to, and that God delights in our prayers. That He takes pleasure in hearing His children pray and ask Him for things. The Bible says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. That's what it says in Psalm or Proverbs 15. The prayer of the upright, upright is his delight. God delights when the righteous, when his children, pray and ask for things. So that should be one of the reasons why we would want to go to God in prayer. Look at verse 9. It says, After this manner, therefore pray ye. And of course, he goes in here and tells us, you know, <laughs> and this is again where the Catholics get it wrong. You know, this is this is what they refer to. I believe in the Catholic Church as, uh, you know, our Father's Prayer. Is anybody in here a former Catholic? Nobody. I'm pretty sure that, you know this is one of the prayers that they have to go and chant. You know, our Father which art in heaven, that name, come, they will be done. You know, they have to say that over and over again. But he didn't say. He says, "Go and pray these words." He said, "No, after this manner, pray ye." Meaning, this is how you should pray, and this is a good way, you know, to to model your prayers. You know, we could start out by saying. You know, thy will, and the, uh, thy kingdom, or hallowed be thy name. You know, sometimes to open prayer before we get to just start rattling off everything we need. Maybe in prayer, it's a good time to just stop and give praise to the name of God. Amen. Lift up the name of Christ. Lift up the name of the Father, and love the, and love on the Lord, and just and, and uh, praise Him. <coughs> Say, hallowed is thy name. <coughs> and he goes on, you know, and, and gives us a list of how we ought to pray. Now, if you notice here in this prayer that Jesus Christ gives him, and he says, this is how you ought to pray. You know, this says, this is the manner in which you ought to pray. <clears throat> notice it's only four, four verses long. I mean, you would think if he was going to, you know, the super spiritual person would say, well, I was just, I was expecting from there on out that this just be how we ought to pray to God from there on in the Bible. 
you know, just pages of how we ought to pray, you know, just go on and on and all the things we ought to say and just wax eloquent. But it's only four verses. You see, when we pray, it doesn't need to be a, a, a much speaking. You know, we don't have to, you know, drum up this, this spirituality to make us feel, you know, holy or something by carrying on and on in prayer. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong, of course, if you've got a burden and you you need to spend a long time in prayer. And I think we've all probably been in seasons in our life or will be where, you know, we have to really get down on our knees and really pour out our soul and our hearts before God. And, you know, that could take some time. It might be something that we find ourselves doing often. But I think that, you know, people sometimes shy away from prayer because they get this idea that it has to be, you know, just this long thing that happens every day. Well, you know, he only gave us four verses on how to pray. I and mean, I think we could go through this and make sure we cover all those bases when we pray. <clears throat> the point is, again, of being sincere. Sincere prayers, they don't need to be long. If it's from the heart, you know, you can get your point across pretty quick with God. I mean, you can think about the two men which went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And when they were praying, remember the Pharisee? Oh, God, I thank Thee, I'm not as other men are. You know, I, you know I'm not an extortioner, I'm an idolater. It goes on and on. He's, he's just talking about how all the things that he isn't. And I'm not as this publican here. I mean, so he had a lot of words, didn't he? He had a lot of things to say about himself. And what did the, what did the sinner say? Or the publican say, Lord, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. And the Bible says that that man went down justified. That was a pretty short prayer, wasn't it? One sentence. So our prayer life doesn't have to be this, you know, overextended, long thing for it to be genuine, for it to be sincere. It's something that can be short to the point as long as it's heartfelt and sincere. Now, if you would, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Because the Bible talks about this, you know, and I think sometimes people... Again, like I said, they kind of shy away from prayer because they get the idea that, you know, that, you know, what could you not watch with me one hour and that they have to, you know, their legs have to go numb and, and, and they have to be, you know, just prostrate before God for hours on end in order to get hurt by God. But that's that's not the case. You know, if we're sincere, if our heart, if our heart is right with God, you know, <clears throat> then we know that we will be hurt of it. You know, the Bible even talks about you know, be not being one who's going to, to say a lot. You know, much speaking is not always a good thing. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Now, and of course, this could be just talking about when we're going to church or just going about our daily lives. This could just be a general attitude that we should have, that we should not be hasty to just utter things before God. But it, we could apply this to the prayer closet, though we don't just have to go and make things up. Well, it's time to pray. Let me just think of some things to pray for so I can get it done and check it off my list of spiritual duties today. You know, if we understand that we're God's children and we have a Heavenly Father who delights in our prayers, and we go to God with a sincere heart, and we don't have, chances are we won't be spending, you know, hours on end down there praying. That we'll, we'll, we'll say a heartfelt prayer, and, and it will be heard. <clears throat> I mean, we could, we could think of examples of this, right? Think of Baal and Eli the, the prophets of Baal and Elijah. Remember that? Where he called down fire from heaven, and he challenged the prophets of Baal to a kind of a, I don't know what you call it, like a, a, you know, a battle of prayer, if you will, you know, where they say, hey, you guys pray to your prophet, if he be God, you know, let him call down fire from heaven. And what does it say? That the, the Baal's prophets, they called unto him from morning until noon, until the midday, right? Cutting themselves and carrying on and crying aloud. And they just went on and on and on and on. And then when the man of God, Elijah, got up and prayed, you know, he prayed two and a half verses. That's how long his prayer was. He prayed 63 words. Yes, I counted it. It wasn't that long. And that was a lot of ifs and its and ands, you know. And he prayed that short prayer, but God heard him because it was sincere, because it was real. And, uh, you know, for sake of time, we'll move on here. But um, <clears throat> in verse 9 there, he says, After this there manner, therefore, pray thee, or uh, after this... Manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Now, if you would, just turn back to Matthew chapter 5, because I want to just draw, again, attention to the fact that this prayer starts like this, Our Father. And that's something, that is just a wonderful thought that we need to understand, that when we're, we're not just praying to, to God. Yes, we're praying to God, but we're praying to our Father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray, Our Father. Amen. And when we have the same Father that Christ has, and that's a thought, you know, that, that's really something. And this is something that he reminded of us often. If you look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, good works and glorify your, fa your Father which is in heaven. Look at verse uh, 44. <clears throat> but I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father, of your Father which is in heaven. And he says again in verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is, in per which is in heaven, is perfect. So, you know, when we pray, and we're starting out, we have to understand we're coming to our Father. And that really ought to be something that endears us. And if you would, uh, let's, let's go over to uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, look at verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. I mean the Bible is showing us here that, you know, this he's saying, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That God is our Father in heaven. I mean that's really something. I mean there's a lot of people out there who wonder who God is. They're going through life, they're not sure who God is. They wonder if there even is a God. You know, but if we're saved and we have the Holy Spirit and we have this book, we can pick it up and we can read and understand that God is our Father. You know, you meet that atheist, you meet that agnostic, you meet that guy who's wondering, well, who is God? Well, I'll tell you who he is. He's my Father. That's that's uh that should be something that compels us to pray. The fact that we have a Father in heaven. The Bible says in Psalm 27. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. I mean, you know, our, our parents might not forsake us in the sense of, you know, doing us dirty in life, but one day they're, they're going to die. You know, they out, they're going to outlive us in all likelihood. And there's going to come a point in our life where we are without father and without mother on this earth, but will God forsake us? Will God leave us? No, we'll always have a father. We'll always have somebody to go to to help us. So we should pray to, to, to God as a child would come and ask something of his father. I think that's why he starts out, he doesn't say, when you, you know, therefore when you pray, say, you know, Lord God, Master of, of heaven and earth, you know, creator of all things. No, he said, our father. Because we need to understand that we're praying to God, we're praying as a child would come and ask something as of a father. Amen. Turn over to Romans 8. Go to one last place in the scripture there. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> chapter 8 and uh, verse 26. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we ought to pray, what, what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be other. So sometimes, you know, we go and pray, we don't even know what it is we're supposed to be asking for. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray for, but the Spirit says, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession and God takes those what's in our heart and just He knows how to pray for us and, and intercede for us. But I think really what else we can learn from this passage is that sometimes just the act of praying can be even more important than what is prayer, what is praying. I mean, God just sees us praying, taking the time out of our day to go to Him as a father, as a child to the Father, and just praying to Him. And He says, you know what, more important than what it is, you, whatever you are asking or don't know what to ask, I'm just glad that you're acknowledging my presence. I'm just you're glad that my child is acknowledging me as their father and acknowledging that I hear them and acknowledging that I'm there for them. You know, sometimes just the act of praying is more important than even what's being said. Just the fact that we're going to our father. You know, really it reminds us of who we are. I mean, but it goes both ways. God's saying, hey, I'm pleased that you're, 
You're taking the time to acknowledge me in prayer, but at the same time, it reminds us of who we are. And if you, I should have had you stated in Romans chapter eight, but if you, I can read to you. If you're still there, Romans eight, look at verse fourteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He goes on and says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. That's powerful scripture. If so, be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified in Him. Uh, glor uh, <coughs> glorified together. The Bible is saying there that we're, you know, we're led of the Spirit in prayer, and that's going to, you know, it, it, the, the, the Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if we're the children, then we're heirs. You know, and joint heirs with Christ, heirs of God. You know, people want their whole life to you know, have that long lost uncle come into their life and, and inherit the million dollars, right? That's that's the dream, right? Well, the Bible is saying, hey, there's no law. He might not be your uncle, but he's your father. And guess what? He's not long lost. He's he is nigh at hand, and uh, you know he's got a whole lot more riches in heaven than than anything we could hope to um, gain on this earth. So I will make one last point here in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter six, just very briefly. But prayer, you know, it ought to remind us of who we are. It ought to remind us that we are the children of God, and that we are joint heirs with Christ, and that you know it's, it's something that's uh, that we ought to do daily. But I do want to point out one more thing about that statement there where it says in uh, Matthew chapter 6. It says there in verse 9 where it says, Our Father. So we're, he's saying this is how you're going to address the one in heaven, right? And, he, and, he, and that's his name right there. Our Father. So the Father is the name of the Father. Amen. Okay? <laughs> Just want to point that out in case any you know unsaved heretics have wandered in tonight and want to start saying that, you know, Jesus is the Father. No, that's not the case. And you go and if you don't want further evidence of that, go read the Gospel of John and see how many times he addresses the Father. Well, what's the name of the Father? It's the Father. <laughs> that's why he says when you pray to him, say, Our Father. That's how you address somebody, right? You call them by their name. So you're going to ask something. If I were to walk in here and you needed something from me, say, Hey, Brother Corbin, can you X, Y, and Z? I'm going to go ask something from God. Of course, I'm going to say his name. Hey, our Father, you know, Father in heaven, my Father, your Father. So God has a name in heaven; it's the Father, and you know He wants His children to pray to Him. You know, and that's something that we ought to do. Prayer is a very important thing, but remember, it's always supposed to be something that's between us and God. It's something that should be sincere and heartfelt, and it's not something that should be done before men to receive glory of them. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray.